May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The musical Wicked is a story of two unlikely friends, Elphaba and Glinda, who most of us know by their titles from The Wizard of Oz, The Wicked Witch of the West, and Glinda, the Good Witch. The musical follows their friendship through time as it struggles through their opposing personalities and viewpoints. Same love interests, reactions to the wonderful, wizard, wonderful wizard's corrupt government, and ultimately to the wicked witch of the West's fall from grace. As the musical ends, the very, the, the last sung song before the finale is For Good. Shared with me years ago by Grace Glaros, it is a song that has shaped me and touched my life deeply, although I have never seen Wicked. It's weird to know lots of music from a musical and not have witnessed it, so. It is a song that delivered me through many difficult days and nights. I am sure many of you know the song, I'll just share the opening lyrics, and I'm not going to sing them, but from Galinda the Good. She says, or she sings, I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them, and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I'm who I am today because I knew you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better, but because I knew you, I have been changed for good. These words and those that follow, bringing the seemingly disparate women together as friends reach to the heart of love in community. Love often looks and feels knocked around from its mourning, but it changes us for good. Through conflict and struggle, people become united in new ways. I felt that unity of spirit last night and I actually had to change my sermon because I was in the room last night with almost 800 people as the Ukrainian music from the heart, from the soul, from this very special place within the Ukrainians who came last night, brought us together, even as they made music together out of the horrible war which was wrought by the evil of Vlad Vladimir Putin. Knit together by trauma as a result of being forced into exile as refugees, brought to this new land, to this new city, children found each other and a children's choir was formed. When I spoke to the children thanking them before the concert last night, it was clear to me that of the 12 kids in the choir, only one of them spoke English. And there they were, I speaking to them through a translator and their children. I know they've left family behind. Some are in the earth of Ukraine. But there they were, changing each other and changing themselves for good. Churches like that too. We are drawn together for some reason. Call it destiny, call it fate, call it the movement of the Holy Spirit, but look around you. You are in the midst of a group of people that you probably never would have met any other way than to come together here and create a community that you have blessed by your presence, a community that has changed you for good, but that you have changed for good as well. Albert Einstein wrote these words years ago. Strange is our situation here upon the earth. Each of us come for a short visit, not knowing why, yet sometimes seeming to divine a purpose. From the standpoint of daily life, however, there is one thing we do know, that we are here for the sake of others. Above all, for those 
on whom, whose smile and well-being our own happiness depends, and also for the countless unknown souls with whose fate we are connected by a bond of sympathy. Many times a day, he finishes, I realize how much my own outer and inner life is built upon the labors of others, both living and dead, and how earnestly I must exert myself in order to give in return as much as I have received and am still receiving. We are knit together in community in ways we cannot imagine and understand, but we celebrate. Last week, during his stewardship moment, Sheldon Taft talked about the communities of co in community. In our case, the communities in community are places where we especially and especially connect with others, with the whole body of Christ, known as First Congregational Church. Some of these communities in community are so obvious. Some are not, like Sacred Earth is obvious for those who are part of it. The choir, to the, for those who are part of it, although it's interesting because the choir has sections, right? So even within their community, there are smaller subsets of community that form special friendships. The deacons, the trustees, the Stephen ministers who are coming into practice this week, right? Next Sunday, we'll bless them. The care team, the house and grounds team, the trustees, fellowship groups, classes, such as the Bible study class and adult education, the youth group, the youth in mission, the staff, various boards, working groups, committees, task force, the church council, liver and onions fellowship group, bread, and many other, like how I did that, put liver and onions and bread together, and many more connections within a community, communities. So each of these parts, and by the way, there is the online community too, that is out there, that is connected each week in their own ways as we worship here. Within each of these parts, we form even closer bonds with some people. Our community grows and strengthens through these bonds and connections that we form. But something else happens. We can either become more generous because of the bonds we share with one another, or we can become less generous. Both things can happen. While the ideal is always greater generosity of spirit, of giving, of financial nurturance of the whole, of time, of talent, and treasure, out of the abundance of joy that we feel in a relationship, sometimes our communities can become disconnected and less empowered. Sometimes those bonds hold together and pull apart at the same time. So it's important what we were doing with our bodies this morning, finding ways to connect. And as you can see, I'm a little disconnected even when I'm doing that, so. But I love the words that were said. What happened? It gets crazy. I just love that. It's great, you know, it's just this, this wonderful thing to move our bodies together. It is at the stress points of the joints in the body where we really find out if we can hold together or not. Here is where I find the Apostle Paul so helpful. In 1 Corinthians 12, he speaks of the Spirit of God which binds us together. In 13, chapter 13, he's addressing the love of God that holds us together. And we all are familiar with those words in the 13th chapter they, that bring together community in a perfect unity. But here in chapter 12, he's speaking of body parts. He's sort of the spiritual, theological mechanic, right? At least 350 years before Paul, Plato, who Paul stole the idea from, got his own picture of the body working together. He talked about the head as the citadel. The neck was the isthmus between the head and the body. The heart was the fountain of the body. The pores, the lanes of the body. And the veins were the canals of the body. I loved what he did with that. To Paul, the church is the body of Christ. And in Christ, all the diverse parts find their unity. As such, Christ has no hands on earth but our hands to do Christ's work. He has no feet to go anywhere now in his existence except our feet to go out and care for others. He has no voice but our voice to tell people how he taught and how he healed and then to do it in his name. I can't tell you how many people I have known 
in the medical profession who heal with a spirit of God in every touch that they have. How he laid down his life, how he rose up from the dead, overcoming the end to bring a new beginning. He has no help but our help. He has us, and that's it. There's a wonderful story that's an apocryphal story that I didn't put in here, but I love this story. When Jesus ascends to glory, he gets to heaven, and the first creature, if you will, the first being he meets is the littlest angel in heaven. And the littlest angel meets Jesus ascending and says, hey, aren't you Jesus? And Jesus says, yeah. And he says, well, so if you're here, and he looks down on the mountain, he says, what are they gonna do without you? And Jesus says, they'll be fine. And he says, really? He said, what's your plan now that you're gone? And Jesus says, they're my plan. And the angel looks down and everybody's crying and missing Jesus already. He goes, do you have a second plan? <laughs> he goes, no. And the angel laughs so hard he falls off the cloud and heads down toward earth. And Jesus reaches down and pulls him back. And he said, I'm glad you find that humorous. But that's the only plan I have, them which is now us, right? We're his plan. And that may be scary to some of us. It may be empowering, hopefully, to the rest of us. And a little of each all the time. Each one of us is a nerve, a sinew, a muscle, a little finger, a toe, an eye, an ear, a nose, an arm, a leg, a heart in the body of Christ. Each one of us is our little community reflected in the total body. When our youth are in mission, they are our heart at work. They represent us. When each of us leaves this place each week, we are the body of Christ spread out to do good work for other people, to spread his grace, his healing power, and all his love. And then we come to realize as giving body parts, as generous communities in the community, that several things are true about the body of Christ as we know it. A body is healthy and productive when each part functions together, perfectly together. The parts of the body cannot covet each other and become useless when they become jealous of each other, right? Although I must say my right hand's a little bit jealous of my left hand because it's always busy and the right hand's just sort of hanging out there. But it can't stay that way because I need my right hand too. The eyes can't be the hand. It's funny, Scott, when you were reading that, it doesn't sound right. I, I, I saw you sort of, what? You know, it's just inside out. It doesn't work. But that's the point. It doesn't work, right? You have to hold it together in its difference. So, to wrap it up, we just need each other. We need each other. Every single one of us needs the other. We don't live in isolation. Each one of us needs the work of the other to succeed. We must respect each other. In the body, there's no question of relative importance. One limb or one organ is not more important than another. I know that sounds odd, maybe particularly, Cami, to those who are physicians, but don't they all work together somehow or another? And if they're thrown off, the whole body is thrown off. I remember years ago, my grandmother had a fall and broke her hip for the second time. It was the second hip. She bro had broken both of them. And I remember being at the doctors with her as she was laying there, or at the hospital with her as she was laying there. And the doctor said the fall didn't break her hip. Her hip broke and she fell. That was the first time I'd ever heard that. He said, at 92 years old, her bones have deteriorated and worn through so much that the bone density was the issue, not tripping or falling. And she said, yeah, even though I grew up on a dairy farm, I didn't like milk. There you go, Grandma, right? So each function, each part must respect the other part to truly do the work. And finally, we have to sympathize with each other. If one part of the body hurts and suffers, if one member of the body dies, we all lose a part of who we are. We have two roses on the table today, one for Rick Henderson 
and one for Pat Grosick. But we've also lost Betsy Zahn, and we're still grieving the loss of Jenkins Smith, who was here with us every Sunday. And the list goes on, right? We go backwards in time thinking of those that we've lost, but we're connected to each one of them too, and we move forwards in time with them on our shoulders, with the saints of glory, with our parents, our loved ones right here with us. We are more than individual parts. We are one. We are one. We are the body of Christ. So, let us reflect the love, the life, the light of Christ to others. Like him, let us be generous in sharing what we have, everything about us, to share generously with others. Like him, let us be kind to everyone we meet. Like him, let us be extravagantly loving. Like him, and in each of the communities we're a part of, here at First Church and beyond First Church, we all have so many different important communities in our lives. Let's be givers, not takers. Let us be the best body we can be, here on the corner of Cleveland and Broad and everywhere else in the world. Being generous, kind, and loving will change us. And it will change us for good. <laughs>